I begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of the Autumn people, and we are also on the traditional territories of many other indigenous communities, including the Apache and ancestral Puebloans. So about 20 years ago, I was in the middle of a total personal crisis. I was in South Africa traveling. I was standing before Nelson Mandela's prison cell where he's in prison for many decades. And I had no idea what I was gonna do with myself, no idea what the future would hold. I'd recently graduated from the University of Arizona with an anthropology degree. But now at this moment, I wasn't sure if I could be an anthropologist at all. And this came from someone who, as Bill just uh, recounted, had really grown up in the field and for, uh, had dreamed of almost nothing else but being an archeologist, an anthropologist. Looking back, I see now that my love of anthropology had deep roots. I grew up here in Tucson and I was fortunate enough to go to a place like Creo Elementary School where I had amazing teachers like Carol Cribbett Bell and Joan Daniels who would do things you know, with like fourth graders like going out and doing oral histories with elders that lived in the community. Uh, we recorded a local shrine. Uh, we even did some participant observation at the tortilla factory that used to be catty corner to the school and mostly uh, participation and less observation. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, it was an amazing way to get a sense of community, of history, of, um, of tradition. But it was really at uh, what's now called the Gregory School, St. Gregory, where I, I fell hard for the field of archaeology. And I was, again, fortunate enough to cross paths with a really amazing teacher, Elliot Lax. Uh, he, uh, as, as Bill mentioned, um, was teaching high school chemistry. He was actually an aspiring archaeologist himself at the U of A until things didn't quite work out there. So instead of pursuing a career in archaeology, he was teaching uh, snotty high school students chemistry. And somehow he convinced the school administration that he should be allowed to teach an anthropology class. And so he succeeded in that, and I was in, in the first class that he taught. And he, he's just one of these people who truly could bring history to life, to bring a subject to life. Uh, and he dedicated himself deeply to, to teaching us. So out of the six students that he taught in that first class, six of, or three of us, half, went on to get an anthropology degree. Uh, he did things like he took us out uh, to Marana to participate in the Arizona State Museum's excavations at um, some Hohokam sites. Uh, we did some experimental archaeology building a ramada, um, and we worked with Alan DeNoyer uh, uh, to do that. On his own spring break, he took us to Chaco Canyon. Uh, we visited Zuni as well. Um, and then in my senior year, uh, he set up a lab for me to do zoo archaeology so that I could actually learn the skills of zoo archaeology, looking at ancient animal, bone, animal bones, again, from the Marana platform mounds. So essentially, as a high school student, I was exposed to all these amazing things about our community and our history, and I was rubbing elbows with people uh, like Paul and Susie Fish, uh, Jim Bayman, who's now at the University of Hawaii, and uh, I, was, I was just in love with the field. And as Bill recounted, I was fortunate enough in 1994 to meet him. And this is what he looked, oh no wait, no, okay, he didn't look quite like that. Um, this is what he looked like, actually. No, I, no, actually he didn't have a mustache, sorry. Um, okay, this is what Bill looked like, more or less, when I met him in 1994. And I had the opportunity to work at uh, Desert Archaeology, the, the cultural resource management firm. And um, everything seemed set for me. Everything uh, you know, seemed like there was a clear career path. I went first to Pima Community College and then transferred to UVA. And I was going to be an archaeologist. So I um, set off. I took classes. And uh, everything seemed to be set for me until I really started to pay a little more attention and learn more really about archeology span in the field and listen to many of the debates that were encircling the 1990s, especially around the relationship between archeologists and Native Americans. And there had been an especially uh, vociferous debate around what to do with ancestral human remains that had been excavated from sites and placed in museums, as well as sacred objects. 
And it was really uh, that debate that perked me up and made me ask some questions about the field that I was entering. And I started to look around and I asked, for example, why aren't there more Native Americans who are archaeologists? Why do so few tribes seem to have such little control over their own heritage? Why does research so often seem to advance the concerns and questions of academics outside indigenous communities, but not ask indigenous communities themselves what interests them and what questions could be answered through archaeological science? And while many archaeologists might study ancient, say, religion and spend their whole lives on it, it seemed to me very few archaeologists we're interested in things like contemporary living religion, those native peoples who were objecting to their ancestors or sacred objects being in museums based on religious grounds. And most fundamentally, why couldn't the field do better in collaborating with native communities? Why simply couldn't we work together? Well, as I looked around and learned more, I saw that this, these questions weren't really about you know, my mentors and the, the, the people around me, these were deep, structural problems that go to the heart of archaeology. So even let's look at some of the, you know, the very basic laws that very admirably protect archaeological resources, our country's heritage, Native Americans' heritage. But many of these laws place the power to manage these resources in the hands of archaeologists and scholars. So this is, for example, just a little bit of language from the Antiquities Act of 1906, which among other things protects uh, archaeological resources on federal lands. And it says that excavations and research can be done, but it's done for the benefit of scientific and educational institutions. We might also think about the ways in which over most of the 20th century, archaeologists were trained not to value or incorporate indigenous traditional knowledge into their research. And while some early archaeologists in the Southwest actually worked hard to incorporate native uh, oral traditions, traditional knowledge, um, by the 19 teens, this, this uh, approach had largely fallen out of favor. And so that we have uh, very prominent anthropologists like Lowy saying that oral traditions have no merit, no value at all for our understanding of the past. And as noted, when it comes to the excavation of human remains, um, and sometimes religious objects. Most archaeologists had little problem with that, while native communities for a very long time objected to this and yet had no mechanism, no way to actually articulate their concerns or have their concerns reasonably addressed by archaeologists or anthropologists working on their own heritage. And so this is a quote um, from uh, Byron Adams, uh, a Hopi tribal member, who in the 1930s worked to end excavations at Awadavi, an ancestral village at Hopi, in part because of the removal of ancestral human remains. So I was told as I was having these problems that there was a wise man on the hill that I should go to, that I needed to talk to. And so I did my best. <laughs> I did my best to reach out to this wise man. I climbed mountains. I called him up. I said, please, you know, I have these questions and I hear you can help me. And he said, uh, sorry, I don't work with students. <laughs> <laughs> and so I tried again, you know, I tried again and I got the same answer. And so unfortunately, although, you know, I had many mentors and many people um, that helped me think about how to navigate these issues. In the end, I graduated and I really wasn't sure how to address these deep structural problems. Because at that point, although there were a handful of individuals who were working on these issues, the field as a whole really had not progressed to the point where there were new theories, new methods, new ways of actually incorporating Native perspectives and meaningfully collaborating with Native peoples. And so it was as I was standing in South Africa at Nelson Mandela's prison cell that it it was in that moment that it really struck me that here was a man who spent decades behind bars doing something that he believed in, doing something that he believed would make a better world. And so for me, I realized that rather than running away from these problems that I'd identified, perhaps I should go back and in my own small way, try to address them to see if there's something small but meaningful that I could do as well. 
So with that, I went back to graduate school with the goal of trying to help bridge the gulf between native peoples and archeologists and join the many others who had already been doing this and struggling to do this for some decades. And so I was fortunate enough uh, in 2001, as Bill mentioned, to get a preservation fellowship. And it was in my first week that, um, as I recall this, TJ, you can correct me, um, that it was, it was literally the first week I, I was invited to uh, sit down with TJ Ferguson. And um, we chatted a bit, and it turned out he'd just received this grant uh, from the National Endowment for the Humanities to study the San Pedro Valley. And he had co-authored the grant with Roger Anion, who's here today. And uh, Roger, uh, very faithfully and, and very um, generously for me, had taken a job elsewhere and so couldn't commit as much to the NEH project. So TJ was looking for someone to work with him. And so, you know, it's like those stories I realize where you go to the Zen master and it, you have to go three times, I've learned. That's the, <laughs> that's the number, I know. At Zuni, it's four, I know, right, Octavius? But, but for, for archeologists, it's three. It's always in threes. So the third time worked. And so TJ and I, uh, began uh, our collaboration, and, and that was really my first instruction and um, the ability to work with a mentor who had been doing collaborative research um, for many years. And so we undertook a three-year project to look at the San Pedro Valley, uh, which is, again, just east of here. Really gorgeous valley, 12,000 years of history, almost continuously occupied by Native peoples, uh, the Center for Desert Archaeology, it used to be called Archaeology Southwest, and Desert Archaeology had identified about 500 archaeological sites in this region, incredibly rich. And archaeologists were learning an incredible amount from a scientist per scientific perspective. But what was missing in part was the perspective of indigenous communities, communities today that still have living traditions related to the valley. So the project that Roger and TJ and others had, had uh, Bill and others had shaped involved inviting um, uh, cultural, uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, leaders from Hopi, Zuni, uh, Western Apache, and the Tana Atam Nation. And so what does collaboration look like? It's actually, you know, there's no magic formula and every project's gonna be different, but for us, it involved bringing native uh, elders and community members out to these sites. So we visited uh, all these different archeological sites from different periods. We went out to the reservations conducting uh, interviews. We worked with museum collections at the Arizona State Museum and the Ameren Foundation. And we involved the, uh, the, the tribal leaders throughout the entire process. So even when it came to publication, for example, we worked with the community to ensure that the kinds of things that we were writing uh, were appropriate and accurate, and also that there would be some benefit for those communities. So I'm sure all of you get those amazing uh, Archaeology Southwest magazines. And so we produced a special issue of that were, that were then distributed to, many, to all of the communities uh, that we worked with, because many of these communities had lost some of the connections in the contemporary era to the San Pedro Valley. Um, you saw the picture of how distant some of those reservations are um, from San Pedro. So this was a way for communities to themselves reconnect to the San Pedro Valley. And we learned so much during this project. I'm so grateful um, to have been a part of it. But I wanted to highlight especially um, some of the, the things that I learned and, and am honored to learn, have learned from Bernard um, and from his autumn uh, colleagues. The first is that um, many of the people we interviewed talked about that they were aware of, they had cousins to the east, you know, the people that lived to the east, their ancestors. Um, but they many times didn't have the chance to actually go to the valley before. And these ancestors that we talked about it more were what the, the group um, that the Spanish called the Sobipari. So these were the, the people that were living in the San Pedro in about the six in the 1600s and 1700s. And so this was an opportunity to reconnect this concept of cousins to the east to this historically identified group, the Sabaipuri. Bernard and his colleagues offered many nuanced interpretations of the archeology, span of the landscape, but especially of Spanish colonization. 
And there's a long, difficult history, especially around the relationship between Autumn and Apache peoples. And Bernard and his colleagues helped us understand the ways in which Spanish um, uh, 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 sort of strategies of divide and conquer work to separate and successfully and to tragic effect often the Autumn from the Apache. There were stories of Itoy, uh, the elder brother who created the Hulkam, uh, those who have gone, um, and then uh, the Wushkam that were brought from the underworld to vanquish uh, the Hulkam. So there were traditional stories as well that stretched even farther back to the groups that the archaeologists call, for example, the Hulkam, those living a thousand years or more ago. And finally, while the Tana Atom Reservation is far away from the San Pedro, we heard stories of elders that actually were still going back to um, the San Pedro, especially around the Oracle area in, throughout the, the 20th century to go and gather plant materials, bear grass and yucca uh, for weaving and basketry, as well as other, other activities. And so that gives you a little taste of some of what we were learning from the San Pedro project. And I became especially fascinated by the Apache history, in part because I had realized, as, as we'll hear in a moment, that so much of the Apache history in Tucson was present throughout my childhood without my even being aware of it. It became what I called a kind of phantom history. It was present and absent at the same time. We know quite a bit about Apache people as they moved into the San Pedro and, and the Southwest um, starting in the 1600s, thanks in part to Spanish explorers. This is a copy of a map of Father Subio Quino's um, 1696 map. And to orient you a bit, you can see the San Pedro Valley in red, uh, Tucson there, and the Sabaipri, and all of the Sabaipri villages along the San Pedro. But you'll notice that Pacheria is described essentially as the region entirely from the San Pedro to the Rio Grande. So a vast region occupied by the Apache ancestors. Uh, different Spanish chroniclers also documented the Apache as well as Sabaipri, uh, the Autumn ancestors in this region. And the Apache, the elders that we worked with, talked about their ancestors, not in the names that the Spanish use, like, uh, like the Sumas, but they used the uh, band names and their clans that once lived in the San Pedro. Also, thanks to the work of Vernelda Grant and Seth Pilsk and Jeanette Casa and others, more than 60 place names have been doc Apache place names have been documented in the San Pedro Valley. And so this is a way in which Apache people maintain a kind of living memory of this place. It's a way to record events and people and who they are in relation to place. And we learned that the San Pedro Valley is a homeland still for the Apache people. There are holy sites that are visited, uh, petroglyph sites, uh, excuse me, pictograph sites, areas where, gathering, where items are gathered both for religious activities as well as traditional activities. I became especially focused on what's known as the Camp Grant Massacre. And this is a long story, it filled a book, um, but just to give you a sense of what I, I learned, especially with the generosity of the Apache elders that participate in this project, um, I learned how the story that was told about this horrendous event had really been biased because all we had learned about it had come from the perspective of the US Army or the perpetrators themselves. So by the 1860s, uh, there was widespread raiding across Southern Arizona and the US Army established a, a fort called Camp Grant along the San Pedro. And the, eventually the Aravaipa and Pinal bands who lived in this area uh, surrendered themselves to the US Army and they were living under the protection of the army. At the same time, Chirica unrelated Chiricahua bands who weren't at Camp Grant were continuing with some raiding in Southern Arizona. And Tucson's leaders at the time, uh, including many of the, uh, the founding fathers um, that, have, uh, that are commemorated in Tucson. So for example, uh, Carrillo Elementary, uh, the Creo family was one of these prominent families that helped organize a vigilante, a vigilante group that went to Camp Grant. And their goal was to massacre the Indians that were there. The, uh, the stories that Jeanette and others shared included a much different perspective on these events. Um, this is um, a story of people who, are, who were victims 
and who also had surrendered and had no idea that this was coming, except for there's a story that there was an elder, a medicine man who had a vision that this was coming. He warned the people to flee, uh, but they did not flee. And so that morning, um, upwards of 100 Apache uh, women, children, and elderly uh, were murdered on the San Pedro. And this is an incredibly powerful story, an important story, and yet it was a story growing up in Tucson that I believe I had never heard. It was a story of my youth that connected to these places, to um, the formation of my own home, and yet it was a story that was a kind of phantom history to me. And so it was through the work of the San Pedro, doing the work on the San Pedro, but also hearing the voices and perspectives of the Apache elders that gives a really different perspective on this, this tragic but important event for us to commemorate and remember. So I graduated from, uh, from graduate school and I went off to Boston for a postdoctoral fellowship. And um, I was uh, once again, once again, kind of lost in the wilderness. Um, not, not this time because of a lack of knowing what I wanted to do, but because of opportunity. And so I was fortunate enough in 2006 that TJ gave me the opportunity to work with his company, Anthropological Research. And so I want to give you just a taste of uh, the kind of collaborative uh, work that uh, TJ and his company um, have done and that I've been fortunate enough to be able to continue to do a bit through the years. So this is a map of a power line that was proposed called the <coughs> Navajo Transmission Project uh, that, that had a, a power line that would go many hundreds of miles across the northern southwest. There are a number of federal laws that essentially require um, the evaluation of historic properties that might be impacted by projects such as this and allows tribes to identify a particular category of sites called the traditional cultural property. And since 1992, uh, this has been a requirement of this, of this essentially an environmental review process. The idea is to be able to identify any potential historic properties that might be impacted by this construction project and to try to potentially mitigate any impacts um, that would be affected through that project. There are also other federal laws um, that apply to the, this kind of work. And this is an amazing way to think about landscape, to think about history, to think about culture. Uh, you, you travel the landscape with groups of cultural advisors and you learn about archeology, span yes. We often visit archeological sites, but we learn about the relationship the relationship of those archeological sites to the landscape as a whole. And so we study the past through archeology, span but it's also through named places, through shrines, through trails, through gathering sites, whether it's plants or minerals, the uses of water. And so it's this kind of holistic approach that gives a very different view of both place and the past. And while most of the tribes, if not all the tribes in the Southwest, work on these issues uh, actively. The Hopi tribe has especially taken, um, I think, a very proactive and unique uh, uh, strategy, set of strategies around cultural preservation. They approach all of these questions holistically. Inter they use interdisciplinary methods. Uh, they look far beyond the reservation. And basically, the ways in which these laws are complied with are also a way to empower the Hopi uh, community itself and also a way for all of us to learn about Hopi history. Another way to frame this kind of work involves what TJ and I have mapped out as the collaborative continuum. And on the left side of your screen is you see this kind of colonial control of the archaeological past, where native peoples have almost no say, no role in the, the work of archaeology and preservation. And then on the far right, you have kind of a radical indigenous perspective of what this might look like. And tribes like the Hopi, um, but Zuni and, and, and Autumn and others take a whole a holistic approach where they might use different um, strategies based on different projects. But I think overall what we're seeing is a shift from the left side here of a kind of colonialist control, much more to an indigenous control through these kinds of projects that allow and foster 
collaboration. So I did that work with TJ for a year. And then in 2007, I had the chance to work at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And the museum really hadn't done much work at all with native communities. And so I saw this, my colleagues and I saw this as another opportunity to uh, try to build new kinds of bridges, new kinds of partnerships with native peoples. So we've instituted a whole range of programs, everything from uh, providing college scholarships to native students interested in science careers, to paid summer internships. For many years, we had something called a Native American Science Career Day, where we paired up 50 Native American middle school students with 15 uh, native scientists in the Denver community. We have collaborative grants that we provide to scholars who are doing collaborative projects with tribal communities. We have a monthly indigenous film festival, and we have a, a visiting indigenous fellowship um, that Bernard was actually our very first fellow back in 2007. And the thing I recall most from that Bernard is you going around introducing yourself as saying, hello, I'm an indigenous fellow. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So we still talk about that 12 years later, 12 years later. So we've also worked uh, through the years with the Zuni uh, and Octavius, thank you so much for making the trip down. Um, the Zuni uh, community leaders and religious leaders back about 2008, they started a project where they wanted to, uh, to correct the record of what museums say about Zuni objects and Zuni culture. Because museums are often uh, inaccurate, um, often unintentionally so, about what it is they hold. And it's really the communities themselves that know the, that know the best. They are the true experts in their own culture. And so, you know, the example uh, now famous um, that Octavius has talked about is at, at, at the museum uh, in Denver, we had an item that uh, was labeled as a um, Zuni net sinker. And for those of you who've been to Zuni, uh, there aren't too many uh, fishing spots these days. <laughs> And so they were really, they really wanted to see this. They got the list ahead of time. They, you show us the Zuni, this is gonna be great. Maybe long ago, maybe our ancestors fished, who knows, you know? Um, so um, they saw that the Zuni net sinker and they looked at it, looked at each other and big smile comes across, as I recall, as Octavia's face said, this is, this is an ax head, you know? <laughs> so it was one of those double pointed ax heads that someone, some museum person somewhere thought it was a, he's that a Zuni net sinker. So it's that kind of correcting of the record um, that the Zuni wanted to do. And so we are one of about a dozen museums that participated in a project that allowed us to update our um, records and ensure that the information was not only accurate, but also culturally sensitive to um, the religious uh, viewpoints of the Zuni community. And finally, I've been hard at work at the museum for the last 12 years working on repatriation, that very issue that first made me think about all of this and, and try to contribute in the little ways I could. And so at the Denver Museum, my colleagues and I have um, been very proactive in working on repatriation. Uh, we're amongst the first museums that have fully consulted on all of the Native American human remains in the collection. We've returned hundreds of sacred objects and through a, a project um, that's led to a recent book, um, Octavius and I uh, took a trip to Europe to try to identify Ahayuda or keepers of the sky. They're, they're sometimes referred to as war gods in English uh, because these, as you can see one laying here in a curation facility at the Musée de Quebranly in Paris, the Ahayuda have been systematically returned from museums across the United States. Um, before a 1990 federal law was passed that requires re repatriation, return of these items, uh, the uh, Zuni religious leaders had affected about the return of about 25% of war gods or Ahayuda that were known to be in U.S. museums. After this 1990 law, essentially every known Ahayuda across the United States has been returned. But as Octavius has been learning, Ahayuda continue to exist outside NAGPRA, outside the legal requirements of this law. Uh, and they do this by uh, being uh, held in museums outside the United States. And so Octavius and I uh, in 2014 
traveled across Europe to try to facilitate a consultation and conversation uh, with, these, with these museums. And so in conclusion, I'd like to propose that nas uh, native voices matter in at least three key ways. I hope you've picked up many ways that it mattered, um, but at least three key ways. The first is, I believe this collaborative work, this kind of cross-cultural engagement leads to better science. This kind of work is not anti-science at all. And for, for this idea, I draw upon a philosopher named Miranda Fricker. And she's a philosopher that studies science and how science works. And what she's done is look at uh, scientific communities that do well, that thrive with new ideas measured in grants and publications. And uh, what she's found is that the communities with the most diverse ideas do the best. Because what happens with often scientific communities is you create what she calls epistemic insularity, which basically means knowledge systems become really insular and become self-referencing. There's no new ideas. Native peoples are able to bring new hypotheses, new ideas, new interpretations in ways that archeologists without those viewpoints and perspectives can't bring alone. Additionally, there's what Miranda Fricker calls epistemic justice or injustice. And this is just the idea that science actually has some ethical responsibilities around the knowledge that it produces. And that knowledge should not be for the benefit of a few, for an exclusive group. But knowledge should largely, you know, unless, it's, unless there are specific strictures around it, for the most part, knowledge that science produces should be shared. And especially with those communities that have the most at stake about that knowledge. In short, what Miranda is, is describing, what Miranda Fricker is describing, is that the ways in which collaborative archaeology is not anti-science in the least, but actually fosters a better science. I would also suggest that collaborative archaeology provides a deeper, more intricate understanding of history. And this is tied to the first idea, that think about the San Pedro Valley. And this is a place that can be studied exclusively from kind of one perspective, an archaeological viewpoint. But when you bring different perspectives, maybe different stories are emphasized. Maybe suddenly this, the Camp Grant massacre becomes a really important story to be told. Or maybe it's about new connections to new stories about Itoi, the elder. Maybe it's about reinterpreting some of those archeological sites that, uh, that Bill had mentioned that actually had influences from the North, the Kayenta people. Essentially, this kind of collaborative works creates a multi-vocal history, a, a, a layered history of different voices and perspectives that ultimately gives us a deeper, richer sense of the places we love and cherish. Finally, I would suggest that collaborative archeology span provides an understanding of the past, not only in terms of history, but also heritage. So archeologists, we're we've been really good at history you know, we study the past, we interpret the past, we construct chronologies, we, we tell stories of places. And sometimes we're good at heritage making too, you know, uh, protecting a place like Mesa Verde or, you know, other sites. But I think what collaborative archeology span helps us understand is the ways in which a whole landscape of the past is a landscape of heritage. And that we can't, it's not enough to just study history by itself that we need to value the past because the past does not exist by itself. It's always someone's history. And if it's always someone's history, then it's also someone's heritage. And in many cases, when we do that, we expand our, our, um, our relationships. We expand the possibilities of what both history and heritage can be so that it is a shared heritage. And if you have a shared heritage, then that is a heritage that exists on a common ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chip. Is that a little bit of noise coming out there? Okay. So uh, at the very Sorry, Chip's talk. Uh, Octavia Seotua did arrive from uh, to go down from Zuni. So, uh, what we're going to do is to give both Octavius and and Bernard Sequeiros 
a brief opportunity to just reflect a little bit on that those early uh, times of spent back with Chip and the One Valley Mini Histories Project. Um, Octavia, since you're so close by, it's okay if I just hand you the microphone. <laughs> Good evening. Um, glad to be here, and uh, I didn't want to miss this uh, opportunity. Um, Speak right into the Just uh, be yeah. with, uh, working with Chip uh, made me more in tune to uh, some of the issues that, that we were always dealing with, especially with the youth. And, and it was the religious leaders that started this whole process of returning all of them. And uh, it's still amazing that to this day we thought we uh, collected all of them. But we went to a, a university in, in Lansing that after all these years went through their inventory and they found one. So we had to go back and bring it back. And uh, this is still an ongoing process of, of returning what was taken from us. And uh, I think we, uh, when we visited, uh, Europe that uh, we tried to make them understand that this object belonged to all of us, not just one person or one individual had the right to relinquish the hype. And I, I did mention that in order for it, it to leave was that each tribal member, even the youngest born, the year old, had to sign off on it before it left the, the village. And it didn't happen. So it was actually stolen from us. So, uh, and San Pedro, and that was the first time I really uh, worked with uh, TJ and, and Chip and uh, Roger and Richard. And uh, this was new for me because I was the youngest member of the advisory team. And uh, I think the first project we did was Jedito, and this one was second, that I actually got invited to a project like this. Uh, the elders invited me to be a part of this. And uh, I always wondered with the first day I went out there, and of course the elders knew what they were looking for. And being the youngest one out there, I just started following what they were doing. They were walking around, looking at the ground, and doing the same thing. So I went over to John uh, Neha, not him, and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, what are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually telling you what, what we were out there for. And from there, I'm listening to all the elders. I uh, just started, um, wanted to be a part of this, putting that information out because there's a lot of people don't, don't really understand the native people because they say that, well, if there's so much history, how come it's in not a written form? And I tell them that it is. If you go to, uh, uh, petroglyphs, pictographs, our information is there. It was left by our elders a long time ago. And we as, as the living descendants, the children, come back and identify what is there. So it, it, I've been fortunate to be a part of this program and uh, they took me to, uh, you saw my picture with really black hair. <laughs> and doing the work, it, it's turning gray. <laughs> I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> that would do. So, uh, Chip, uh, I want to thank you for having me a part of your work, The Plundered Skulls and Stolen Spirits. Uh, it's an incredible book. Um, gives a lot of history of what our people had gone through and what we're still going through. But thanks to uh, a lot of archaeologists here that want to work with Native communities, it's really opening the door for us to put that information out. Because we, growing up, heard it from our elders and it's oral history. But when you come to places that they were talking about, then you start connecting all of these places. And it's not, it's not a fable, it's not something they grabbed out of thin air, it's thin air, it's repeated every generation. And nothing has changed. That information that we use to make people aware of our history in all of these places are coming from them, learned it from them. So uh, just hopefully I can be working at this, but I've, I've been working at this for so many years that um, 
I told the Park Service last year that I was gonna, that was my last trip, and of course, they uh, they all stood up and said, you're not gonna do that, they're gonna be working with us. <laughs> and I, and so I said, oh, well, I guess I don't really have a choice. <laughs> but I, I do wanna be out there putting that history, the Zuni information out, because the work that we're doing is very important, because that information now is being put up in publication and people are becoming aware of what we had to go through. Our elders were very strict and they were, I'm pretty sure TJ knows that, they didn't want to put that information. And Chip knows that too. If you ask them, they'll, they'll either climb up or didn't say anything, or they keep the wrong information. But, uh, took a lot of things that was going wrong with some of our work. A lot of our sacred uh, objects were not being protected. And I told the elders that it's because of us. If we had gave a little information, then we'll make sure that these places, these items are protected. But they don't know. They don't know what is important for us. And that sort of changed and uh, after that, they started giving information on what they wanted out there. But if it was like pulling teeth, uh, you know, from an individual, it was really that hard to get that information. But when we, as the Zuni people, got together, they were so open. I got all that information from them. I didn't get it from a book. I didn't get it from going to school. I actually sat with them and, and heard them and listened to them and got that information. So a lot of years, I, I became a medicine man in 1970, and also being with that group, I have elders that, that knew of our history and identified all these different places that have never been uh, mentioned, have never been visited because of the land issues, you know, we try and go somewhere and, there's a sign that says private property do not enter. Our important sites are on the other side. So what do we do? We turn back. But because of projects like this, the doors are open now that we can actually go into the places <coughs> and give our history that has never been put out there. And I want to thank uh, all the archaeologists in here that have been working with the tribes to open the door for us to get that information to the people that, that that want to listen, that want to know of our, our history. And uh, uh, I'm very fortunate to have been working, and still working with uh, with uh, Chip and TJ, and now Marin is, is a good uh, person for us to work with, because she's, she's very sensitive, she's very aware of, of what we want, what information we want to put up there. So, uh, like I said, uh, I know this was uh, honoring Chip, and we just hatched out ago, a couple of days ago, and it's still going on. And uh, last night, I, I, well, this morning, I went to sleep at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Woke up at 7, drove here, and I thought I was going to be here early, but I didn't know that there was some real projects. <laughs> when I, I was there for about 30 minutes or longer, just trying to get across the bridge. <laughs> and so I was looking at my time, looking at my time, and, and I got to my room, and there's some field cars. I'm here, I'll be there. <laughs> but uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, like I said, I, I wasn't going to miss this for the world to be here now. Thank you. Indigenous fellow, that's great. <laughs> I remember most about that was that uh, I got a call from Chip when he was working at Denver and he says we just received a grant for uh, community curators do you want to be my guinea pig? <laughs> <laughs> I said sure so that was my trip to Denver that was a good, very good two weeks um, in 2000 the Thong Autumn Nation provided the necessary funds to build and or to plan and build a, a cultural center and museum for the nation to house many of the artifacts that were identified that needed to come home because of NAGPRA. 
and also to teach our children about their history and their culture, our community members. So I was hired in 2001 to coordinate the design and construction of this uh, facility. In, um, in 2002, I was asked to come to a meeting uh, with a, a group of archaeologists that were there to meet with our Cultural Preservation Committee and our Cultural Affairs um, staff to talk about a project that they had received funds for and wanted our participation in as a tribe. And so there I met uh, Chip and TJ and Roger and I don't know if there was anyone else with you at that time. Bill? Yeah. What do you think, Bill? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so the discussion went on that uh, about the project and, and its goals and and uh, after the meeting, uh, the late uh, Joe O'Keen and I were assigned to work with this group of archaeologists on this project. And so uh, one of our first responsibilities was to identify elders in our communities that uh, would help us to make that connection, a reconnect uh, with the San Pedro River Valley. And so we identified a group of uh, elders who agreed to participate in this project. Uh, I also had a committee that was um, that I was working with in the initial um, uh, work on the museum, uh, and so that was the first group I think that we took out to the, the valley to 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 hear or to show them some of the archaeology and to and to kind of elicit some kind of stories or whatever that might make us make that connection with us and that valley. Uh, I think the, the one connection that was really strong at that time was the Saguaros, because the Saguaros were so healthy looking and they were so numerous, there were so many of them. And I remember some of those women were saying, look at all them harshen. Just think of all the bayadish, the fruit that they were produced. Why did we ever leave from here? <laughs> And so that was that first connection. We selected a group of elders, and uh, we made several trips to the San Pedro River Valley, and uh, visited many sites. Uh, I remember at one point, uh, there were two brothers that were elders, uh, Joe and Jose um, Enriquez. And uh, they were standing up between some mounds, and they were pointing at something, and they were kind of laughing with each other. So I went over and asked them what they were looking at. And they were saying, Chuamakut, Chuamakut, which, which is our word for a roasting pit. And they identified a roasting pit in the area. And Chip came over and TJ came over and said, well, there's one here and there's one over here and there's one over here. And the whole discussion on, on roasting agave came about mm -hmm. and how these men talked about how when they were children, in the village of Queenswell, the whole community would go out into the mountains and everyone had various jobs. And their jobs as young boys was to collect as much firewood as they could in the valley to bring to the roasting pits. And some of the men would be up in the mountains collecting uh, agave and they would bring it all together and they would roast them. And then they said, we just waited and waited and we would roast them for two, two nights. And then when we would take them out, it was really, really good. It was very sweet. You know, this was one of the few times that they, they ate it and sweet. So at the museum, we asked, once we, had, once we built the museum, we had activities going, we asked the uh, Enriquez brothers to teach us how to roast this agave. So we went out and we did it very traditionally. We built a firing pit and we lined it with rocks. And we went out and we collected the agave, brought it back. Uh, brought grass in, uh, prepared everything, uh, roasted for two days, two nights, unearthed it the next day, opened it up and ate it, and I was very disappointed. <laughs> because my definition of sweet <laughs> is or whatever they were. <laughs> Their definition of sweet was more of a, a sweet potato or a yam. <laughs> Sweet from the agave, which is probably a lot healthier. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Twenty. So, so, so Gide and Chip and the Enriquez brothers and I went out to that site to see where the villagers would go to roast the goddess. I think there was at one this time a discussion on salt, the salt pilgrimage, the salt gathering. And so TJ and Chip and I uh, went down to the Gulf to visit uh, one of the salt collecting areas that our, our uh, ancestors would go to. But I think for me anyway, what really made this connection to that valley was a day when we were out at a site, and I still cannot say that name, Guy Gunnabha Cave, right? Mm -hmm. Hawan Pita, we call it. Guy Gunnabha Cave, there's an archaeological <coughs> site there. And we were standing on this, we were, we, we were looking at the, the village, or what was left of the village, so which was just really rocks uh, lined up in circles in that area. And there was a big roasting pit there, and we were standing on a mound, which was a melted adobe building. And Chip was telling us this story about the survivory that lived in that village, and how the Apaches came and raided that village, and how the autumn in that village all gathered inside that, that adobe building that was there and how they were being picked off from the roof with one musket that the Apaches had stolen from the Spanish. And it's a very sad story. But the connection was made in that Mr. Enriquez, Jose, he pulled me aside after that story, and he said, Who are these people that he's talking about? Who are these people? that he's calling the Sabaikri. <laughs> what I see here is the village of the, the autumn, our ancestors. And so that connection was made when they mentioned, well, yeah, just think when we came in contact with the Spanish, we called ourselves autumn. They called us Pimas and later Papagos. But when we were called Pimas and Tapagos, we always referred to ourselves as Autumn. So these Autumn that lived us all along the San Pedro, they were Autumn like us, but they called them Sobaikri for whatever reason. And so that connection was made. I remember many, many visits we had uh, at the Amaranth and at the Arizona State Museum looking at the artifacts that had come from that valley and how these men that were sitting around openly talked about many of these things and the importance to our way of life and how they understood it. I think that was only possible because of the mutual respect that had been developed, that collaborative atmosphere that was created by TJ and Chip in, in working with our elders. And there was this sense of learning from one another. We were learning from them as they were learning from us. And I think that's why this, this project was very successful. I want to thank the two gentlemen for creating that atmosphere, creating that mutual respect that was needed to really pull this thing together. Thank you very much. A little bit of time for maybe a question or two for, for Chip, if people have one. Um, and thank you both for, <laughs> for underscoring how collaboration really works and how it takes time and the, the language of communication, all those, those elements. So thank you both for your uh, contributions here. Any questions that I can pass the microphone to you? Thank you for coming. Um, I have had the opportunity of walking through. Just put it on. Oh, just down here. No, right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Chip. Um, <laughs> I was trying to keep it private. Okay. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to go through.
includes the, if you will, the federal repository at the museum, which has just rows and rows, acres and acres of artifacts and objects that I know the museum at one point, this is about 10 years ago, had no clue what in the world was gonna happen with all of those, because they didn't belong to the museum. They came off with federal land. And I just wondered, is that part of what you're able to get into and review? Is that now happening? Is it, if, are some of those artifacts getting repatriated? I just was real concerned about what was gonna happen to all of those. Yeah, and so you mean at the Denver Museum? Yes. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. And also, before I answer, I just also want to thank um, Octavius Bernard. Thank you so much for the kind words and sharing your thoughts and experiences. And thanks for the long drive. Um, really, I, I owe you for that one, Octavius. Um, and thanks, too, for Bill. And for those who supported the Preservation um, Fellowship, really, without that, um, yeah, it, it, my work would not have been possible. And, uh, I'm just beyond grateful um, to have been a part of this uh, project with TJ and um, everyone else at the center at Archaeology Southwest. So um, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, as like most museums, there's some collections that it has both possession and legal control over. And then there's some collections that it holds, but it's holding on behalf of another organization or the government in this case. And so, yeah, so the museum holds quite a number of federal collections, um, possesses them, but doesn't have legal control over. So we facilitate research on those collections. Uh, you know, we, we house them. We have a brand new um, uh, collection facility. So I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, maybe not, it's, it's relatively new. So it's a new facility. Um, but it, in terms of NAGPRA, in terms of repatriation, it's the responsibility of the uh, federal agency that actually has legal control over those, not those organizations that simply hold them. But they aren't mm -hmm. doing anything about that, are they, in all fairness? So, you, you know, it's pretty uneven, I think, is one way to think about it. So there was a um, GAO report um, almost a decade ago mm -hmm. that showed almost every um, federal agency subject to NAGPRA because it holds Native American collections. So I think it was 17, 14, 17 collections, something like that. Essentially all of them were out of compliance. Um, I believe about half of them had not even done any work at all with NAGPRA, even that, and that was 20 years into the law. And uh, my reading of the landscape from a far remove would be probably not much has changed in the last 10 years. So yeah, so the work of repatriation, again, you know, the work that got me started in all this, it is nowhere near done. And um, in, the, in the book that, um, and these, by the way, are some of the works that I reference um, throughout the talk. Um, the book that um, Octavius mentioned, I estimate that it will probably take about 238 years to deal with just the Native American human remains um, in US collections. At its current pace, and anticipating even a little bit of an acceleration, um, it's probably well more than two centuries. And then that's not even including the many millions of grave goods and the tens of thousands of sacred objects. So repatriation, unless there's some dramatic change in the future, uh, it's a part of life. It's a part of what it means to be an anthropologist and archeologist today, uh, which is just one more reason to collaborate because these conversations aren't going anywhere. You know, I mean, it's just a part of what it means to do this work today. So thanks for the question. One more question in order? I think up front here, Bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm totally ignorant coming to, to this tea. Not totally. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm missing this European connection, okay. and I wonder if you could explain that a little yeah. further, sure. So um, over the last several centuries, uh, if not a bit longer, museums all around the world have collected Native American objects. Um, so everything from you know explorers back in the 1700s would collect things. Later on, um, countries would have archeological expeditions or they would send ethnographic collectors, you know, people who would go into living communities and collect baskets and weapons and musical instruments, all those kinds of things. And so there's Native American cultural materials all around the world. 
However, most are, are in museums in the United States, um, North America, and then there are a handful of museums in Europe that hold quite large collections of Native American materials. Um, in some cases, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of Native American items. And um, there currently is no law, no international treaty, nothing at all that would facilitate the return of uh, sacred objects or ancestral remains from Europe to the United States. So there's a, there's a 1990 federal law in the US that applies to tribes and museums that have received federal fundings and, and agencies. Um, and they have to comply with this law that often leads to re the return of these items, but nothing at all outside the United States. So in this case, you know, uh, Octavius and I learned that there were um, then it was seven museums. We've since learned of two more. So you know, there's at least nine museums outside the United States that hold one or more Ahayuda, these sacred um, beings that the Zuni create to protect the Zuni people and keep the universe in balance. So the only in, in the absence of any kind of legal requirements, the only opportunity we have is for Octavius to go meet with the administrators and curators and explain who he is and why his communities would like these back. And then it's just based on the, the kind of moral interpretation of the staff and their ability to act um, that will determine whether or not those Ahiuto will ever come home. I, I wonder about private collectors. They all cooperative and repatriation projects. Uh, so the question is about private collectors. And so this 1990 federal law does not typically apply to private collectors. Um, but one heartwarming story, I, so I think okay to share, Octavius, about the um, altar piece. The, so um, Octavius and I, when we were in Europe, uh, our trip that resulted in part in an article in the New York Times. And um, about a week after that, uh, I got an email out of the blue um, this woman saying, you know, I have these things, they've been in my family uh, for a long time, and I was always told they're sacred, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I said, you know, sure, sh send me a picture, you know, let's see. And so they sent me a picture, and it was like these, um, like a Calder mo mobile or mobile, however you pronounce it, you know, with these birds kind of hanging around. And I, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of, you know, sacred things at Zuni, but I'd never seen anything like that. And so I was just about to write to her, um, yeah, don't worry about it. I, this looks like a Calder art piece, you know. Um, but I'm like, oh, I'll, just, I'll just run this by Octavius, you know, just in case. And so I, I forwarded on to Octavius. And um, he, uh, as I recall, I think called. Um, and we had a conversation. And he said, I've been looking for these for 40 years. And uh, so it turned out that um, these had been stolen, they're altar pieces that had been stolen, um, misappropriated off the reservation, um, that it referred to, well, Octavius, do you want to pick up from there? Do you want to explain? Maybe you're in a better position. Well, uh, um, they were from a medicine society, and it's a representation of the, the Milky Way with all the different, uh, the, Swallows, the purple, uh, purple worm, all these different birds that uh, are associated with rain. And um, when we were in our medicine house, we moved into a different place because uh, some of our items were disappearing. And so we wanted to move to a different place. And before we could take everything out, this individual uh, just sold it. I mean, we, we knew they were there. When we went back to get them, they were gone. Mm. And so we knew what they looked like. So we made the same number. And I, I still remember what they looked like being the first first initiated. I, I walked in there, and I saw the altar with the, up on the, the wall. <coughs> and uh, so we collected uh, a cottonwood and started carving what we thought was almost identical. But when I got the, there, when I got information from Chip, 
and when he uh, sent me the photos, it was very difficult to see, but they were exactly what we made. So I, I told Chip that if at all possible, we'd like to get the back. So there was a lot of back and forth, and finally Chip said that we're going to go to California to bring them back. So we went, and um, when we did um, finally see the collection, that the ones that we made were different. They looked exactly, painted exactly like it, but the biggest important thing that we did not put on the new ones was the corn hearts that was in each one of them. Mm -hmm. When I saw them, it, it just put, I mean, I was really at a point where I was almost in tears when I saw them. And when I took them back to our medicine house, I didn't inform anybody that I was going to go collect them. And during the winter solstice, I finally took them into my medicine house. And I, told, I said, I've got something here that we we lost about 40 or more years ago. And I've been looking for them, and thanks to, with help from the good friends that they were identified, they were located. So I got them out of the box and I showed it to them, and they were also stunned and amazed that we left the hearts out. So now we have the new ones up there. What do we do with the old ones? And I said, I, I know what I want to do, but I want your input. We can either retire them, which means we have we can take them out and bury them, or we can reuse them. And they all said, let's reuse them. So we incorporated, instead of having, uh, I think it was like uh, eight or nine, now there's 19 or 20, and they're all up on the altar. And so my next question was, do we want to replicate and put the corn hearts in the old ones? And they said, no, because yeah. we've got the original ones. The ones with the hearts, the ones that were made later on will just accompany the old ones. So it was, it was very emotional and moving for me to get them. And when I presented them to my medicine society, I could see the elders that knew of their disappearance, tears coming out of their, from, from their eyes, and, and I felt the same way. But um, uh, thanks to work that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, the, the work that Chip and DJ and Bill are doing, that people are now becoming aware of all these items that might be considered art, but they're very, uh, they're important, they're sacred to us. And, uh, and, and a lot of these uh, sacred items that disappeared were, were getting back. And there's also two altar pieces that is, uh, is in the possession of Denver Nation Science that uh, we've identified that we're gonna get back to do. And it's also an altarpiece from my society. Um, um, it's come a long way, but uh, people are becoming aware that these are not art pieces. They're very important to us. I want to thank everyone, uh, Chip, uh, for telling your story here um, and connecting to uh, um, what seemed like a, a simple little project back in the day um, and to help see how it's, it's uh, had a big effect on a much larger scale and for Octavius and, and Bernard sharing uh, what you uh, shared with us. Um, it's very powerful to hear such positive outcomes and I hope but that you do keep working. Um, <laughs> and um, let's thank them all one more time.